Our scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus and his sisters hosted a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who joined him at the table. Then Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound, of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet dry with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, complained, This perfume was worth a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money back and would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, Leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she's used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. This ends the reading of the scripture. Our story today starts as a dinner party. Mary and Martha have opened their home to Jesus and his disciples. They'll eat and they will talk. Then something extraordinary happened. It was something you wouldn't believe could happen. If this were fiction, it would be beyond the reader's suspension of disbelief. Mary and Martha are special friends of Jesus. We don't know how this friendship developed. Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead, was their brother. In a previous gathering at their home, Mary sat at the foot of Jesus as he taught the disciples. Martha complained that Mary should have been back in the kitchen helping her. Even at this point, Mary is doing something different. In that time, women weren't supposed to be students. Mary was taking in every word, perhaps understanding Jesus better than the disciples were understanding him. You see, Jesus predicted his death and resurrection three times before the events in today's scripture. The disciples didn't get it. When the disciples first learned of Jesus' resurrection, they doubted it. Thomas was not with them, but later had to be convinced of Jesus' resurrection. At the dinner party, Mary knew what was going to happen to Jesus. It had been only a few days since she and Mary anointed the body of Lazarus. Could that have influenced Mary? Did she think it was a waste of oil to use it after Jesus died when she could do something good with it then? The Bible doesn't explain why Mary even had a container of anointing oil that was worth a year of a man's wages. Perhaps she and Martha bought it to use for future burial anointments. Perhaps Mary cleaned out their savings account to buy it. I wonder what the ever practical Martha would have thought of that. Well, I think Martha would have thought it was just fine. She knew who Jesus was. When Jesus came to see them after Lazarus had died, she made one of the most powerful statements of faith recorded in the Bible. Now let's imagine the scene at the dinner party. In those days, it was customary to recline while eating. There was a lot of talk, but it wasn't really happy social talk. Death was stalking Jesus. The resurrection of Lazarus was a tipping point for the religious leaders who didn't like Jesus. Jesus was bad for business. People were following Jesus instead of following the religious leaders. These leaders saw their positions not as positions of servanthood, but as positions of power and status. There were many witnesses to the resurrection of Lazarus. There were several Jews at the home of Mary and Martha after he died. They were there to comfort the sisters in their loss. Mary was not with Martha when Martha met Jesus as he entered Bethany. Jesus asked for Mary. When word got to the household that Jesus had called for Mary, the others at the house went with her. They witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus, and naturally, they had to talk about it, and word spread like wildfire. To the religious leaders, this was too much. Now that Jesus had performed this unheard of miracle, more and more people would follow him. They decided it was time to kill him, and they also planned to kill Lazarus. So at the dinner party, death is stalking both Jesus and Lazarus. It made for a depressing gathering, but then, out of nowhere, Mary blows up the dinner party. There are stories of women anointing Jesus in the three other Gospels, but none of them happen at the home of Mary and Martha. In each case, the woman is not identified by name. In one of the stories, the woman is described as a sinner, which is a euphemism for prostitute. I have to assume that those were separate incidents from what happened at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. All of the stories tell of a woman who pours oil on Jesus and worships him. Now, Mary's behavior was outlandish. Here at the dinner party, an unmarried woman caressed the feet of a rabbi. How scandalous was that? For her to have wiped Jesus with her hair, she had to let down her hair. The expression, let down your hair, is a popular expression. It means to put away your inhibitions and behave casually and informally. 
Society has a lot of expectations for how women should appear. Men don't have to deal with such expectations. But there's, but women are generally, for many years, maybe not so much today, were expected to have their hair done nicely in public. And in a lot of cases, the hairdos required they had to kind of pin the hair up. And uh, perhaps if like military women have to pin their hair up so it can fit underneath the hat. Anyway, when a woman returned to the privacy of her bedroom, she could relax. No one was evaluating her hairdo then. She would remove all of the pins and let her fall, hair fall naturally, and then she could maybe act naturally. And there were similar, ex similar expectations in the time of Jesus. Women were expected to have a modest appearance in public. That meant either short hair or pinning up their hair. Although Mary was at home, she was among a group of people, all of whom were men except Martha. The expectation was that she would keep her hair pinned up as if she were in public. But Mary let her hair down literally. This was the first social rule she would break. There's also an expectation in those days that women didn't converse with men other than their husband or brother. Certainly there was to be no physical contact. But Mary broke that rule too. After pouring out all of the expensive oil on Jesus' feet, she rubbed it in. That definitely was a no-no. Then she wiped his feet with her hair. Honestly, it was very sensual and very intimate. I suspect everyone in the room was shocked, except Jesus. The fragrance of the oil filled the room. It broke through the doom and gloom, overpowering it. It was a case of love overpowering death. And that's the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus defeated death. You can't ignore a smell. For example, the smell of fish literally makes me sick. I'm allergic to fish. In our household, we never have fish for supper. Sometimes a household member will fix their own fish dinner, but they will do it when I'm not around. We can't choose to smell one thing or another. Smell takes control of us, taking over that which we'd rather be able to smell. In the church I came from, a homeless man began to attend services. He smelled very badly. It was almost sickening. A person asked an usher what he was going to do about the homeless man. This person expected him to throw him out. To his credit, the usher told the person he wasn't going to do anything about it. The smell made the man unappealing to the person who complained. The man was, in fact, a gentle and friendly man. However, he suffered from mental illness. Interestingly enough, the reaction of those present at the dinner party was not about Mary's actions. It was about the cost of the oil. The disciples were enveloped in a beautiful aroma and had witnessed an act of pure love and passion. Maybe it was a male thing. They were more interested in the numbers than in the act of passion they witnessed. Of course, Judas was unhappy because he would have liked to get his hands on that money. He was the treasurer and he stole from the common purse. Interestingly, Jesus didn't call him out for his motivations. Instead, Jesus made a statement that has been thoroughly misinterpreted over the years. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Now, this has been interpreted to mean that supporting the church is more important than supporting the poor. And that's wrong. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus makes a similar statement in response to the complaint about using the money for the poor. Chapter 14, verse 7 says, You always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do something good for them. But you won't always have me. Jesus is merely saying that they should, always should be helping the poor. They will always have that opportunity, but they won't always have him. This situation was an exception. They had the Messiah among them in person. This small group of men and women had a privilege that billions of believers would never have. Mary's sacrifice was costly. Jesus' sacrifice was costly. Mary's sacrifice was extravagant, as was Jesus' death. Mary emptied the ointment. Jesus emptied his life. Mary's washing of Jesus' feet also foreshadowed Jesus' act of washing the feet of the disciples. Mary risked her honor and reputation to show her love for Jesus. Jesus put aside his role as the Son of God to humble himself and wash the feet of the disciples. We're all at a dinner party. Sometimes death hangs over the dinner party. Sometimes it's joy. We're at a dinner party with Jesus. We witness acts of sheer love and passion for the Lord. We see that in the action of those who show love, grace, and mercy, the actions of ministering to others, we need to be Mary. We need to be willing to show our love for Jesus in an extravagant way. It may not be in a way that costs us money, but it may cost us time and could cause us grief. 
As believers, we must be always willing to show extravagant love to others in the way that Mary showed it to Jesus and in the way Jesus showed unbelievable love for us. Amen.